This is Melina Lee Williams Haas. I deeply appreciate you listening and taking the time to hang out with me. I will be addressing issues of life, the universe, and everything that are often bogged down and mired in shame and grief, and talk about how they can be repackaged to be useful and gorgeous and fucking awesome for you. So, sit back and relax, or, you know what? Sit up and freak out. However, you prefer to listen. Let's go. I've discovered about myself in the aftermath of having COVID that apparently I am not allowed to be human. I've spent the past 24 hours absolutely punishing myself for being exhausted. I have spent hours today thinking about what a a shit person I am because I was so jet lagged and wiped out from traveling that I slept for eight hours through three meetings and a business dinner. Slept like a fucking rock. Now, are people annoyed, aggravated, put out by the result of my my exhaustion? Probably, and to some extent, yes, yes, sure. Does that make me a bad person? No, it does not. However, so much of who I am, I tie up in expectations that I set for myself that are extremely high. And often I meet those. Usually I meet those expectations. And if I don't, it's usually because something catastrophic has occurred outside of my control. Now, technically, (laughs) I suppose I could have set an alarm if I'd had my wits about me to do so. But in my fucking brain addled state, I was just like, you know what? I'll get up. There's no way I'm going to sleep through all this stuff. I just need a couple of hours to catch up because I didn't sleep on the plane, but for maybe an hour and 45 minutes, I think, according to my watch. But what's super interesting to me is the amount of abuse that I will heap upon myself Anytime I I fail to live up to my expectations or anytime I feel that I have disappointed someone or put someone else out. And I guess there's tons of reasons for that, but I find it extremely fascinating that I cut each and every person around me all sorts of slack because I understand life is tough sometimes and dealing with COVID can be really complicated and there's so many unknowns. And while I do feel so much better, I still get tired very easily. And it's really hard to think. Remembering stuff is difficult. Well, put it in your calendar, you say. Yeah, that's great. But you need to actually remember to look at your calendar. And when you just feel like you're just pushing and pushing and pushing through, maybe you don't. Why is it so hard for me to forgive myself? Why is it that I enable everyone else around me to feel good about themselves and work so hard to try to be the person that is understanding and forgiving and flexible and easy? And then I turn around and I'm an absolute tyrannical bitch to myself. I don't have a good answer for that. I really don't. And it's kind of fucking depressing because usually I can figure stuff out about myself and I can say, well, here's why this is going on. And mm, I feel that that's coming from, you know, childhood shit or adolescent shit or, or fucked up relationship shit. But the reality is I honestly cannot think of anyone in my life who has been directly as oppressive against me as a human being. <laughs> as I have been over the years. Sure, I've had a couple of relationships that were not optimal in terms of how people treated me. But the thing is that like once people started treating me shittily, I pretty much evacuated, but I can't get out of my own head in this way. I can't let go of the internal emotional perfectionism to which I have subjected myself for low these 53 years. Because to be honest, I cannot remember a time where I was not putting incredible amounts of pressure on myself from childhood, from when I was a little tiny fucking kid. 
and felt like when my parents were fighting or when my dad was giving one of his four-hour lectures on Sunday about how we were very poor Christians, I always felt like, I always felt like I could save the world. I always felt like if I could just do the right things, everything would be okay. And that's a first child syndrome, certainly. And coming from a household where both of my parents had their own issues to struggle with. And they were really young. Let's not forget that. My mom was 21 when I was born, right? Like, if I look, think about myself at 21 and having the responsibility of an entire human, what the hell? And then also realizing that the person who's the father of this entire human that you just pushed out is probably a little not right in the head. As it turned out, then she's got a kid and married to someone who's definitely got PTSD and is almost probably bipolar. You know, there's a lot going on. We all have a lot going on. And I want to talk to myself today. I want to just see what the fuck is going on with me. That I can spend an entire day taking myself apart in ways that I would never permit anyone to do to my face. I don't think anyone ever would. But it's very easy to be very hard on ourselves, isn't it? I consider myself to be someone who is an excellent communicator. Yeah, someone who really knows how to get their point across, someone who listens well. And despite all of that, I recently had a pretty serious communication breakdown that resulted in some work that I had been doing with some other folks completely having to be dismantled and canceled. And that's all right. Shit happens. But the hard part of it is, the part that really is making me beat myself up super badly is, why did this happen in the first place? Why didn't my amazing communication skills make it so that this mistake didn't go down, didn't happen? But you know what? We all have moments where things just don't work out. And that's all right. I mean, shit, look at the past month. I well, Okay, I need to go off on the side rant here. So I'm recording this from Vienna, where we just arrived yes, yesterday, yesterday morning. We just got here and then had to pretty much get here and then turn around and go take the train to Budapest so that Georg could have some dental work done. Because <laughs> getting dental work done in America is so expensive, no shit, that we kind of hobble together until we can know that we can be here in Europe where it's easy and inexpensive, right? Like just over-the-counter dental work shit. You can get a root canal and a crown done for maybe like 300 bucks. <laughs> just try to get anything more than a filling for that amount in, in New York, right? So we're taking care of and doing all of these things. And what I find really amazing is my ability to shuffle off all the shit I did. Okay, look, I had COVID and I was positive and pretty ill for a good 10 days straight. And in the midst of that, I had to prepare for a three month, three week trip to Europe, get all of my things together, get Georg's things together, and then fight with two insurance companies and a university to make sure that we could get all of our medications for this trip. When I tell you that this process was frustrating and, and maddening, that can't even really encompass the seriousness because during the pandemic, pandemic, <laughs> pandemic, yeah, during the pandemic, United Healthcare decided that this was a great time to stop the ability for you to obtain medicine for three months at a time through their online pharmacy. They just cut all that out. In addition to that, they made it so that not only do you have to go through your insurance and then go through the Optum RX, which is the insurance company that handles your medication, which is separate from your regular insurance and also separate from your eye insurance and separate from your dental insurance, right? So you're working essentially with like four different companies. Try telling that to someone whose head has been punched in the fucking back of the skull with COVID, right? So... I go through the insurance company, 
they're telling me, well, you have to get an approval through Columbia. So I call Columbia. The HR department's like, okay, yes, yeah, send us a list of all of your medications and what countries you're going to. And you have to fill out this whole online form. And I'm like, wait a second. Why do I have to tell some random person in the HR department of Columbia University what my medications are? This seems like a HIPAA violation of some sort. What the fucking, who am I going to fight though? I need those medicines. I would like to not drop dead from hypertension or diabetes. So I do what has to be done and I fucking get the goddamn stuff, right? I mail this off and they're like, great. So now I have to wait for United Healthcare to approve this. Then I have to call my pharmacy so that they can put through the request so that it can be denied. And then once it's denied, I have to go through OptumRx to get them to approve it, go back and have the approval rubber stamped by Columbia and then approved again, I think, through United Healthcare. I'm not sure. But every time I called any one of these places, I kept being told that nothing had been forwarded, nothing was being done. And I'm like, well, who was doing something? Because I filled out this form and I'm trying to get this through. And I was reassured that everything was working. But then when I double checked it, nothing was, pro bro, it was in fucking sane. I then decided, well, worst case scenario, worst case scenario, I can go through my doctor's office, get copies of all these prescriptions and then get the prescriptions filled in Europe. We would have to come out of pocket, but even so it's a fraction of the price of the drugs in America. Even the most expensive drug that I take, which is maybe $500 for one of my diabetes medications and injection pin cost me $60 in the Czech Republic when I had to get it. So is that the optimal scenario? No, it's not. But could it work? Yes. So I called my doctor's office, made online appointments so that I could try to get this prescription filled, sat on the phone waiting for the doctor to come on. No one showed up and I called back and they're like, we're so sorry. How about in another hour? Great. Four different times I was stood up for these online appointments. I sent messages through the patient portal to my doctor, never got a response. All I wanted was copies of these prescriptions. And I finally got through to one of the aides there who I was trying to explain. I said, look, here's the situation. Going to be traveling, need drugs, can't get them, need a prescription just in case I can't. And he's like, okay, well, I can print out a copy of your medical records and a list of all the drugs you're taking. I'm like, no, no, no. I need an actual prescription. I need the physical prescription so that I can go in somewhere and show it to them. And he's like, okay, what exactly do you mean by that? And I'm just gobsmacked. I'm like, is it, have we gotten to the point where no one writes an actual physical prescription anymore to the point where someone doesn't know what a written prescription is? I bit my tongue and I calmly explained what a written prescription is to a person who works for a doctor's office. He attempted to print them out and then told me he was having some sort of trouble and could he call me back? Sure. After that, I didn't hear back. It was getting close to closing time. I finally messaged him and said, uh, hey, um, not trying to be a pain, but I'm leaving in three days and I, I really need this stuff. And he asked me to call him back tomorrow. Well. Thankfully, between that incredibly frustrating conversation and the next day, I did get word back that allegedly our prescriptions had been finally approved. This was on a Friday afternoon. So that meant I would have to wait until Monday and we're leaving on Tuesday. The stress was not pleasant. But I got it together, got everything pulled through and obtained our medications for the three and three quarters months that we will be traveling. And I just sort of brushed that all by, like this was some easy thing to do, like I didn't matter, like it was a lot. I'd like to give myself a gold star for accomplishing that calmly. The next thing I was beating myself up over was that for my attempts at starting this new consulting company, my kink doula business, that I hadn't changed my calendar. So I had several people who were calling for consultations in the middle of the night or while I was on a plane or because that was something that slipped through the cracks. And of course, my assumption is that everyone thinks that I'm some sort of loser and an asshole and irresponsible. 
which you know what even if they did fuck them <laughs> it's so funny how i veer between this incredibly defensive stance of feeling like people should cut me some slack and then also feeling like no one should ever cut me some slack i am a piece of work but i know that many of you can probably relate to this i know i'm not the only one who sets incredible expectations for themselves and and then feels incredibly let down when we do not cross every T and dot every I and tie everything up neatly at the end of the day with a perfect bow. But no one and nothing is perfect. And as much as I would like to believe that I have power over space and time and can do all things I can't. I wish I could love myself a little bit better. I wish I could stop this internal assault, this war, and it's difficult. And then to top it off, you know, what's even more rich is that like when I am beating myself up, I beat myself up for beating myself up. Like, like I'm hashing myself to death because I'm not compassionate with myself. Like what the hell? It's so ridiculous. It's so crazy. And I'm glad I'm actually saying it out loud because when I say it out loud, I realize how silly it is. And I realize that if anyone, any one of my friends, an acquaintance, a fucking ball, fucking ball headed stranger rolled up to me and voiced these opinions about themselves, I would be like, whoa, hey, hold on, man. That's awful harsh. It seems a little bit much, don't you think? And yet I let that toxicity ooze all over my soul from the inside. I am the source of that. I am my worst enemy. What I have achieved in my lifetime is kind of amazing, and yet I overlook it. The people I have in my corner, the folks who support me, the people who love me, are some of the most remarkable human beings I have ever had the pleasure to know. So many folks who have been instrumental in my journey, people who were my mentors, even though they didn't know it, I now call friends. <laughs> if I could have looked at the person I am today, 20 years ago, I would not have recognized her. I would have said, how is that even possible? Those were not dreams that I held in my heart because they were not dreams that could have ever occurred to me. And yet... And yet, I so easily fall back into this cycle of self-abuse and emotional self-harm. And I need to pull away from that. And I need to cut myself a break. And I'm just going to sit here for a while and consider how I can be kinder to myself. And I'm going to start by winding up this episode, even though it's not 30 minutes, that's all right too. I've said what I had to say to myself and maybe you can just join me for a minute of just breathing and quiet reflection. And if you have not been absolutely, perfectly, wonderfully kind to yourself, Maybe sit with me for a bit and think about how amazing you are. Think about the miracle that is your body being alive here, now, today. Maybe the body that you're in is experiencing difficulty. Maybe the body that you're in struggles. And that's still beautiful. Maybe the brain that you have has chemistry that makes some aspects of your life really hard. And that's still beautiful. I want to just hold you for this moment and say, you know what? You're fucking awesome. The parts of you that are dark, the parts of you that are weighty, the parts of you that you don't really like, even those parts are gorgeous in their misshapen lumpiness, in their spikiness. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if we could just look at all facets of ourselves, at all the things that we do and love them and appreciate them and be grateful for the mistakes? 
Before I got sober, I did not anticipate that I would live to see 40. Today, I'm... Oh gosh, I'll be 54 next month. That's a miracle. It's a fucking miracle. So the fuck what? I slept through some appointments. I needed that sleep, obviously. I should say thank you to my body for taking over and taking what it needed <laughs> and not pushing my way through because of expectations that I have set up because of expectations, because of fear that people won't love me if I fuck up. Isn't that was at the heart of this fear? At the center of this is terror, that if I don't walk that perfect razor line, I won't be loved. <laughs> it's an incredible amount of bullshit, isn't it? <laughs> so let's just take a moment to let the tears be okay too, yeah? <sighs> Thank you for listening. And I love you. And I love me. <laughs> and I'm going to work on letting go. I'm going to work on letting go of this anger that I have about being human. This frustration that I have about being imperfect and I'm going to embrace it and I'm going to share it because that's one of the reasons that I am still alive because my higher power came down and said look be messy girls just do it do it big <laughs> so here we are and I love you and I'm here You've been listening to All That and Mo. Thanks so much for spending your precious, precious time with me today. My podcast is produced by Cody Crabb. Theme music by Georg Friedrich Haas, as performed by Marcus Weiss. And I look forward to spending time with you again really soon. Mm -hmm.